Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, as always, I hope you're uh, coping and finding ways to adapt and perhaps thrive in the, uh, the new situation. And I, I wish you uh, fortitude and stamina as we move forward. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, final projects. Obviously, for both the uh, for both the undergraduates uh, and the graduate students, you now have no uh, weekly reports, uh, and you're just working on your final project, uh, which will be due the night before you present your final project orally. Um, so it'll be due. Uh, your written and oral components of the final exam will be due uh, at Sunday, uh, Sunday, May third at 11:59. PM and we will all be present uh, online uh, at 10:30 a.m. on Monday to uh, listen and comment on each other's uh, final projects. Uh, I'm still working out the logistics of how that will work, but we will mostly follow what's mentioned in the final report uh, document. You will be orally presenting a two and a half minute or three minute YouTube video. I haven't figured out the exact. Uh, length yet. Um, I will be playing a YouTube playlist either here in the stream uh, or on YouTube or in a private uh, uh, remote lecture hall and you will unmute your, your mic and talk over your YouTube video uh, for the two and a half or three minute uh, period that you have available to you. We will talk exactly about how that's going to work uh, during our final class which will be uh, next Thursday. Okay, um, other than logistics, any questions about uh, anything I can help anyone with about final project? Um, what if we have another class during that period of time? Uh, you should not have another class during uh, this period because this is the final exam period. If for some reason you do have a class during that time, please contact me and we'll make special arrangements. But that is the exam period and there should be no other classes uh, during that time. Okay, any questions about PyroSim? Anything I can help people with uh, in terms of final projects? Um, if so, please type it into chat. Um, if not, we will continue our discussion on evolving robot uh, body plans and neural controllers. Um, last week we looked at the first attempt to do so by uh, the computer graphics researcher Carl Sims. Um, let's see, oh actually there's a question about collision groups. Um, I think, yeah, let's, let's have a quick discussion about collision groups. This is going to be important for some of you. So I'm going to go, as usual, to the MechLab uh, PyroSim documentation um, that's available here. And we scroll down, here's the documentation. Um, and let's see, I think, I'm not sure where collision groups are described in here. Uh, let's see, let's look for, search for collision. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's do this from the top here. Okay, so uh, when, you, when you send an object to PyroSim, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. So let's take a send box. So when you send a rectangular solid uh, to PyroSim, you can assign it a collision group and what that means is that everything inside a collision group, so if we add multiple objects inside the collision group, they are all going to collide with one another uh, or not. So um, we can either uh, set current collision group. Uh, just give me a moment to find, to find this in the documentation. Okay, just give me one moment here to find this. Ah, assign.
Okay, all right. So assign collision. So let's go back to send box for a moment. Okay, so you'll notice that one of the uh, one of the arguments you can send when you uh, create a box or a cylinder, or a sphere, is the name of a collision group. So collision group equals something in string. So for example, that string could be robot. So we could send a whole bunch of objects and indicate that they belong to the same collision group. Uh, robot and now um, we can then specify how all of the objects inside that collision group should behave when they come into contact with one another so for example uh, if I send uh, if I send all of the objects let, let's say I create one collision group called robot and I send all of the objects to uh, the robot collision group and then I send a whole bunch of additional objects, but they, I assign them to a second collision group called environment. Uh, I can then specify, I'm sorry, I can then specify how objects uh, from different collision groups should behave when they come into contact with one another. By default, everything inside the same collision group does not uh, we, we do not detect and resolve collisions between them. So objects that are within a collision group can connect and pass through one another, which you would, which you would hope for for uh, objects in the, that make up the robot. And then if we call assign collision, that means that any object from group collision group one and any object from collision group two um, should not be able to interpenetrate one another, which makes sense if, for example, we have objects making up the robot and objects making up the, uh, the environment. Okay. Uh, hopefully that helps, and, and the good thing to do is to just to create an empty simulator like you did in assignment one and send some objects to uh, the simulator and assign them to different groups and call assign collision and play around with this a little bit in an empty simulator where it's easy to make changes. And then once you have collisions working in the way you want, you can uh, port that code into your final project. Um, let me know if that answered your question, Crisis Ostrich. All right, uh, Zoroman asks, do you believe that the genetic algorithm we went over in class is powerful enough for our final projects? Uh, I, actually, I see Crisis Ostrich has another question, so let's stick with the collision groups discussion for a moment. So if I had two arms and an object to be interacted with, I would want two collision groups, one per arm so they would collide with each other and one for the object. Uh, exactly, so that's a great example. So imagine we have uh, we have a two-armed uh, robot, and it needs the two arms can uh, manipulate an object. So we would place all of the objects that to ma that make up arm one in a collision group called left arm, and all the objects that make up the right arm, we'd add them to a second collision group called right arm, and we'd add all the objects that make up the object you want the robot to manipulate into a third collision group called group three. And then you would call assign collision three times. You'd call it on group one and group two. So left arm cannot interpenetrate right arm. You'd call it again between group one and group three so that the left arm cannot interpenetrate with the object. And finally, you'd call assign collision a third time between group two and group three so that the left arm, uh, sorry, that, so that the uh, left right arm and the object cannot interpenetrate with one another. Make sense? That's a good example. Thank you. Okay, uh, back to Zorro Man's question. Uh, do you believe that the genetic algorithm we went over in class is powerful enough for our final project? Um, the short answer is probably not. Uh, as you saw, the genetic al algorithm was probably not powerful enough for, uh, for the phototaxis task in assignment 10. So it depends on what your final project is. You might find that some of the, the tasks or the fitness functions you're creating um, are actually relatively simple to evolve solutions for and others are much more uh, difficult. Um, if you're finding that the genetic algorithm doesn't work for you, uh, you might try uh, a more powerful evolutionary algorithm and I'm happy to discuss that with people uh, in office hours. But as a quick fix, um, one of the problems with the genetic algorithm that you're using, which you probably noticed, 
is that once there is a, a relatively good solution in the population, within a few generations that solution uh, spreads throughout the population and you lose all diversity in the population and there's little to no further improvement uh, in your uh, in your evolutionary algorithm. So if you're finding that your genetic algorithm is not working very well, meaning you're not getting very good solutions to your problem, what I would suggest you do is uh, revert back to the parallel hill climber, which is not that different from the genetic algorithm. You have, for example, a population of 10 random solutions. Each individual solution produces a child solution. And if the child solution is better than its parent, it replaces its parent in that slot uh, and and on you go. So there is no spreading between different slots, uh, between the 10 slots uh, in the population. So in essence, you're maintaining 10 different lineages, 10 different and diverse solutions to the problem uh, in parallel. Uh, I think for many of you, you'll find that that works a little bit better than the genetic algorithm. If you see that it's helping a little bit, you can make the parallel hill climber better by just increasing your population size to 20 or depending on the laptop you're running things on, population size of 50. Obviously, the larger you make the population, the wider the distribution of or the variation of candidate solutions you have to your problem and then just run that for as long as you can. So basically, broaden your parallel hill climber by increasing the population size and deepen the parallel hill climber as well by running it for more generations. Now that obviously comes at a computational cost, so now things might take you several hours uh, to run, but uh, a good thing, a good habit to get into uh, over the next few weeks is to set things up in the evening and let your evolutionary algorithm run overnight on your laptop and then play back your best solutions from the previous night. And if things are working, great. If not, you might consider uh, making some change to the fitness function or the evolutionary algorithm or the robot to make the task a little bit easier, run it again the following night, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, M.A. Eaton has a question. Is there a way to change the color of a light source so I can use light sensors instead of colored uh, ray sensors? Um, unfortunately, at the moment, there is no way to do that. There are no colored lights yet. That's on our list of to-dos to add to PyroSim, but it's not there yet. Um, what you can do is place multiple light sources in the environment um, in boxes with different color and add both a light sensor and a ray sensor to your robot and create a fitness function that combines uh, uh, that computes the fitness of the robot based on the light sensor value and the ray sensor values as well. You might be able to use the color of the box to scaffold, or you might be able to use light to scaffold detecting objects of different color or vice versa. So uh, M.A. Eaton, think about trying to combine both, uh, uh, both modalities, light and uh, ray sensors. Um, M.A. Eaton continues and says, since having two robots use light sources where both are embedded in their bodies seems to mess up their own light sensors. Ah, I see. So you have two robots and you're putting light sources uh, inside them. What I would suggest is put two very large boxes on, on the backs of both robots and those boxes are of different color. And if both robots have ray sensors, as long as it's a relatively large object sitting on top of the robot, it, there's a good probability that even a randomly moving ray will hit the object and register that color. So if you're trying to evolve the robots to look at each other and then maybe one runs away from the other, try using large boxes of different colors or large spheres uh, on, their, on their backs and see how that works. Remember that um, by default, all objects have exactly the same mass, one kilogram. So if you make a very large object, it's relatively, uh, it's not very dense. It's still got the same mass as the other body parts. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions related to PyroSim or the final project. So back to lecture. Yeah.
Okay. All right. So again, we are thinking about uh, evolutionary algorithms, and one of their advantages over other machine learning algorithms is we can broaden the reach of an evolutionary algorithm so that it can alter over evolutionary time both the body plan and the control, uh, the neural controller of virtual or physical robots. Carl Sims demonstrate, demonstrated uh, um, an approach to this back in the, the 90s. So he demonstrated the how to do this. And we started last time by uh, addressing the question of why. Why bother making a much more complex evolutionary algorithm where we're altering body and brain simultaneously? There are several answers to the question of why. Some of those uh, answers have yet to be discovered. We started by looking at one of my previous attempts to answer this question by incorporating uh, b changes to both body and brain, but those changes occur over three time scales. So over e evolutionary time or phylogenetic time, uh, in the experiment you're going to see, you're going to see that from generation to generation over an evolutionary algorithm, the bodies of the virtual robots are changing. At any one generation, if we watch simulations from that generation, you'll notice within a single simulation, the body of the robot also changes over its quote-unquote lifetime. And we're going to refer to that as developmental or ontogenetic change. So that's a slightly faster rate of morphological change. And then, of course, from one time step to the next, in an individual simulation, uh, the robot is rotating its hinge joints and registering sensor values. So obviously, its body is contorting and changing uh, at, the, at the fast time scale, the, the here and now or the very short term. So we're going to combine these three time scales together. And we started to see last time how that actually makes it easier on an evolutionary algorithm to evolve useful behavior for virtual robots. OK, so I showed you sort of an overview of this experiment, how it works. We're going to start with a control experiment where we're going to evolve upright an upright quadrupedal robot to move towards the light source in front of it. And after uh, several hundred generations, we finally got uh, this solution. But it took quite a bit. It took quite a number of evolution. Uh, uh, it took quite a number of generations until we got this solution. We're going to compare this to uh, we're going to compare this to um, an, uh, we're going to compare this to another algorithm where we're going to introduce this idea of morphological scaffolding. And the scaffolding here, remember that the idea of scaffolding, the idea of scaffolding is that it makes things easier on a learner to gain the basic uh, building blocks of a task. And then once it starts to understand the task, we can gradually remove uh, that scaffolding and the robot does the task on its own. So this ontogenetic change going from lying flat on its belly to eventually standing upright, that's going to actually make it easier to evolve controllers for the robot. So um, in this experiment, we're going to start with robots that lie flat. And these are random controllers. We saw these last time. Once this flat robot evolves the ability to move towards the target object, like you see here, we're going to pause evolution and make a change to the ontogenetic trajectory of the robot. So we're going to play back exactly. Uh, uh, so now the ontogenetic trajectory, as you see here, causes ontogenetic change. Over a single simulation, the robot is going to go from lying flat with horizontally splayed legs to legs that gradually become more vertical. So in this single video, you can see two rates of change, two rates of morphological change, the legs slowly changing from horizontal to vertical, and the oscillations of uh, the hinge joints themselves. So we see ontogenetic change and the here and now change. Once the robot with this particular ontogenetic trajectory going from flat to upright, once it evolves a controller that gets it to the block, we pause evolution again. We don't start it over. We're just pausing the evolutionary run. And we introduce a new ontogenetic trajectory, which is the robot is going to start 
The robot is going to start with legs that are 45 degrees, and those legs over the simulation are going to rotate from 45 to vertical. So legs start 45, and over the length of the simulation, the legs become more vertical. And in this case, the robot kind of gets towards the, the light source. Um, we set a, in this experiment, we set a threshold. So once the robot got close enough to the light source, we considered that success, and we moved on to the next phase of the evolutionary algorithm. The threshold wasn't set very high, so this actually counts as success. Once this particular uh, controller evolved, we paused simulation and, in and introduced the last ontogenetic trajectory, which is the robot is going to start with upright legs and maintain those upright legs uh, over, the, uh, over the simulation, over its lifetime. And in this new ontogenetic trajectory, we continue evolving uh, controllers until, in this experiment, we got this controller, which got the upright legged robot to the light source. So I'm just going to pause here and talk about a few aspects of, of this algorithm and how it differs from this algorithm. So we've got this idea straight. You just saw in morphological scaffolding here these three time scales of morphological change. We saw the slow evolutionary change from generation to generation over uh, evolutionary time. And at points during that evolutionary time, we changed the ontogenetic trajectory. So we see four different ontogenetic trajectories here. In the first trajectory, the robot starts lying flat and stays flat. So just as a reminder, these inset, uh, these inset axes here report with the dotted line the height of the robot's center of mass. So in ontogenetic trajectory one, the robot stays uh, lying flat throughout its lifetime. And uh, we, throughout this one evolutionary algorithm, we're only evolving the controllers um, we are manually changing the ontogenetic trajectory. So at this point, once a controller evolves that succeeds, we now uh, induce the robot to start flat and move to the upright position. So we introduce a second ontogenetic trajectory. When the controllers uh, finally adapt to that body, we then introduce this ontogenetic trajectory where the legs start at 45 and rotate uh, vertically. The controllers have to keep adapting to that changed morphology. And finally, the, in the fourth and final ontogenetic trajectory, the robot starts upright and stays upright. So we're assuming that in this algorithm, as well as in this algorithm, what we want is to evolve a control policy for an upright uh, legged robot. So you can see that the two cartoons here are exactly the same. So the end point is the same. But in this experiment, in the middle, we're introducing some scaffolding. We're allowing the controllers to evolve on robots that are lower to the ground. And once those controllers get good at getting the robot to the light source, we gradually lift the robot up, which in essence is removing the morphological scaffolding. And as one of you pointed out in chat at the end of last uh, lecture, that makes things easier on evolution because it dissociates two problems that evolution has to solve, displacement and stability. Obviously, if you're lying flat on the ground, you don't have to worry about stability. Evolution can focus on finding controllers that induce uh, displacement or fast movement in the robot. And once evolution finds that, we are gradually going to introduce the second challenge, which is uh, stability. And evolution has to continue adapting controllers um, that now also maintain stability in the robot. Uh, Daniel asks, uh, did you use the best controller from the previous morphological scaffolding or for each part a new controller was used? That's a very good question. The answer is the former. So from the point of view of ev the evolutionary algorithm, we are simply evolving controllers throughout this evolutionary algorithm. But periodically, a highly fit controller, like one that works for the flat robot, when we now rerun that controller in the next generation, 
on the new ontogenetic trajectory, the fitness of that controller is probably going to drop a little bit because that controller has never experienced a robot that stands upright. But by definition, that controller works for the robot when it's lying flat, so the controller at least gets the flat-lying robot to move for a while before it stands up. Yeah? So you might remember that, uh, you might remember uh, you might remember near the beginning of class, I showed you another scaffolding experience, another uh, scaffolding experiment where uh, where we placed this blue block increasingly far from the robot. Uh, we placed the blue block increasingly far from the robot, and it had to continuously adapt. It had to continuously adapt its gait to grab this ro this blue block that was further and further from it. So this is environmental shaping or scaffolding. The term shaping and scaffolding are used interchangeably in the literature. So from this, this experiment is not that different from this experiment. From the point of view of evolution, it is simply evolving controllers for robots. But sometimes the highly fit controllers drop in fitness because there's been a change in the environment. Like, for example, the blue block is now slightly further away in a simulation than it was before. Or there's a drop in the fitness of a controller because the internal environment has changed. The body of the robot itself uh, has changed. So that's why we called why we called this approach morphological scaffolding to differentiate it from environmental shaping or scaffolding. Um, there's been a lot of work in the literature about environmental scaffolding and we haven't had time in this lecture to talk about it. Um, there's a very nice experiment from back in 2002, one of the very first evolutionary robotics experiments using a commercially available physics engine. In Ryle and Husbands, uh, what they did was to evolve controllers for a simple biped like you see here. And early on in evolution, if the biped started to fall over, um, the code would automatically apply a compensate, compensating impulse force or something that would push the robot back upright again. This is almost, almost literally training wheels on the bicycle. And then as evolution proceeded from one generation to the next, as the robot got better and better at taking steps in the simulator, the strength of these compensating external forces got weaker and weaker until in the last dozen or so generations there were no external supports uh, whatsoever. Right? Again, environmental scaffolding. Um, here's an example from 2005, which uses the passive dynamic walk, uh, uh, uses a, a kind of passive dynamic walker. You'll remember the passive dynamic walkers from our discussion on legged locomotion, and we saw there how passive dynamic walking can scaffold hybrid dynamic walking. And this concept actually has an old history and, and is talked about quite a bit in an older textbook about uh, robots. And you can go and check that out in more detail if you're interested. Okay, so what we're going to do next is to try and really understand how the scaffold wor works. Under what conditions does introducing this middle time scale make it easier for us to evolve controllers for some final robot that does not, I'm sorry, that does not change its body over time. Perhaps we have some physical humanoid and we want to evolve controllers and simulation that work for the physical humanoid. But of course, if we have a humanoid, it's bipedal and very likely to fall over. So maybe in simulation, we start with robots that are not humanoid, that are closer to the ground, and gradually change their bodies in simulation. Even if the physical robot that we're eventually going to try our evolved controllers on is not capable of morphological change. Right? Scaffolding is usually uh, temporary and is thrown thrown away. That's the idea. Okay.
So uh, I'm going to walk you through different versions of this algorithm. We're going to look at a total of five variants. We're going to start with the one I just showed you, which is no physiological or morphological change at all. We're going to evolve controllers for an upright robot that uh, starts, evolution, starts evolution upright, it ends the evolutionary process upright, and during the lifetime of each individual robot in an individual simulation, it starts upright and ends upright. So there is no phylogenetic change. The body doesn't change over evolutionary time. There is no ontogenetic change. The robot does not stand upright over its lifetime. And we can ask the question, how long does it take or how many, uh, how many simulations do we need to run until we evolve a controller that gets the robot to the light source? That's the number we're going to measure. So in the results you're going to see in a moment, we did 100 evolutionary runs of just this using different initial random seeds. And we can ask on average, how long did it take the robot to uh, get to the, the light source? I'm gonna compare that to a second experiment. In this experiment, we're gonna introduce phylogenetic change, but no ontogenetic change. So we haven't seen this experiment yet. How does this work? Well, we're going to start by evolving controllers on the flat, the lying flat robot. Once controllers evolve that get this robot to the light source, we pause and introduce a different ontogenetic trajectory where there is no ontogenetic change. So the robot is going to start with legs uh, one third rotated downwards, and it's going to maintain legs that are rotated one third downward throughout its lifetime. So these controllers are then going to be continue. Uh, we're going to continue evolving these controllers on this body. Once this body gets to the light source, we're going to introduce another ontogenetic trajectory, which is the legs are rotated two thirds. Uh, vertical and continue evolving controllers on this third body plan and then once success is reached there we're going to rotate the legs completely vertically and so we end up again with our target robot which is an upright legged robot assume that we have a physical upright legged robot that we want to eventually transfer evolved controllers to we continue evolving the controllers here on this body plan, and we then ask over this entire evolutionary algorithm, we're going to run 100 uh, trials of this evolutionary algorithm and compare them to the 100 trials of this evolutionary algorithm. And we can ask, how many simulations in total did we have to run until we found a controller that gets the upright-legged robot to the light source? So far, so good? Okay. Let's carry on. All right, we're going to look at a third experiment. This is the one, this is similar to the one that we just saw uh, back here, where we're going to have both phylogenetic change, the robot's body, the ontogenetic trajectories, or how the robot's body changes, is itself changing over evolutionary or phylogenetic time. Uh, and there's also now going to be ontogenetic change as well. Uh, when we start these evolutionary algorithms, the robot is going to start lying flat and its legs are going to become vertical over its lifetime. Once evolution succeeds in finding controllers that get this robot to the light source, we're going to now accelerate the horizontal to vertical rotation of the legs so that the robot obtains the completely upright vertical pose in the first two-thirds of the simulation. And then for the remaining third of the simulation, the robot has to stay upright and continue moving without falling over. And when evolution is able to find a controller for this robot that gets it to the light source, we further accelerate ontogenetic change, developmental change. So the robot grows from lying flat to standing upright over the first third of its lifetime and then maintains the upright vertical pose for the remaining two thirds of its lifetime. And then in the fourth and final phase, we throw away this ontogenetic change altogether and we continue evolving controllers on the upright vertical robot until 
evolution finds a controller that gets this robot to the light source. So if we look at the right-hand panels in all three experiments here, we're again ending with the target body plan. We did uh, another 100 runs of this evolutionary algorithm, so we've done a total of 300 evolutionary runs uh, so far. We're now going to introduce uh, a fourth type of change that we haven't seen yet, which is topological change. You'll notice that I, I use the term here parametric versus topological. So what is parametric? Let's start with that. Well, let's assume we have an additional parameter here, theta, and theta dictates the angle of the legs relative to the body. So here, theta is zero when the robot's leg is upright, and that theta gradually changes from zero to negative 90 degrees over a single simulation in this case. In this case, theta changes from zero to negative 90 degrees over the first two thirds of the experiment. In this case, uh, theta changes from zero to negative 90 over the first third of the experiment. And finally, theta starts at minus 90 and ends at minus 90. That's parametric. So there's a parameter that describes the orientation of uh, some of the robot's body parts relative to others. Topological change means that we are now going to assume, we're not going to assume that the number of objects that make up the robot are constant. So the robot is going to exhibit a particular type of ontogenetic change, change over its lifetime, which is growth. In this fourth experiment, we're going to start with a robot that has no legs, and once the controller evolves uh, gates, uh, evolves controllers for this robot that gets it to the light source, we're going to replace this robot with one that has very short, stubby legs like you see here. And then when the controllers adapt to this body plan, we're going to try them out on this body plan and continue evolution on this body plan and so forth. So let me show you... Um, uh, sorry, let, let, let me just talk about the fifth and final experiment, and then I'll show you another video that illustrates this idea of topological change. Uh, uh, sorry, let me back up. I forgot to mention in this fourth experiment, again, there is phylogenetic change. You can see that the body changes over phylogenetic or evolutionary time. <coughs> But there is no ontogenetic change. The body plan stays the same over each individual simulation. In the fifth and final experiment we're going to look at, we're going to put all three of these together. Uh, Daniel asks, how can a robot with no legs be able to reach the light source? That is a very good question. And as promised, I'm going to show you a video of the legless robot in a moment, just trust me, there is a way that the legless robot can get there. In the fifth and final experiment, we're going to put all these things together. We're going to allow phylogenetic change. So you can see if you look at the inset um, axes here, and remember that the inset axes show the height of the robot's body over a single simulation. Uh, we can see that these inset axes are different over phylogenetic time or evolutionary time. Um, in this, and we're also going to introduce ontogenetic topological change here. So what do we mean by that? We mean that the topology itself, the number of body parts that the robot has, is going to change over ontogenetic time. So in this case, in N here, when we start uh, the, this fifth evolutionary algorithm, it's going to start by running a controller on a legless robot. And in that simulation, the legless robot is gradually going to grow longer and longer legs that change from being horizontal to gradually becoming increasingly vertical, like you see in cartoon N here. So the robot is growing legs, and the parameter or the angle of those legs relative to the body is also changing. Uh, once controllers evolve to get this robot to the light source, we're going to accelerate that ontogenetic topological change. So the robot transitions from its legless to its legged form uh, over the first two thirds of its lifetime. And then it maintains the upright vertical legged form for the remaining one third of its lifetime. 
Once controllers evolve to get this robot to the light source, we're going to accelerate ontogenetic topological change again. The robot is going to transition from legless to legged faster and maintain the legged pose for longer. And then finally in Q, as always, we're going to throw away this particular scaffold, which is short horizontal legs. And these robots are going to start or they're going to be born in the upright vertical pose and hold it throughout their lifetime. Okay, I'm going to show you a video of this fifth experiment in a moment. We'll come back to this uh, many t uh, several times, but just to remember, we've got five different experiments. We're going, or five different evolutionary algorithms, if you like. We're going to run each one 100 times, so we have a total of 500 evolutionary algorithms. And what we can ask is which of these five is better than the others? And by better, we mean if we take the best controller out of the end of each of these 500 evolutionary algorithms, and we average the fitness of the 100 best champions from here, and average the, the fitness of the 100 champions from here, 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 and here. Uh, I'm sorry, not average the fitness. The fitness is always the same. They're all successful at getting to the light source. I'm, I apologize. We can ask instead, how many generations did it take, or how many simulations did we need to run until a controller was found for the upright legged robot at the end? Okay, as promised, the video. Um, this is showing a hexapod, not a, or a six-legged robot, not a quadruped or four-legged robot, but you'll get the idea. Here is I'm going to play I'm going to play this video, and it's going to show you a successful controller that gets an initially legless robot, but increasingly legged robot to the light source. Okay, I'm going to play this a couple more times. As I do, you're all PyroSim experts now. As you know, you can't change the size or the length of a cylinder inside a single simulation. You can't grow a cylinder in PyroSim. So how did we pull off this trick of creating increasingly long and increasingly vertically oriented legs in PyroSim? So a little bit of a, uh, a trick to this. Does everybody know what it is? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Uh, Zoroman, uh, got, Zoroman, Zoroman got half of the answer. There's a piston joint. Remember, piston joints or linear actuators connect two objects together. And assuming you set the joint normal correctly, they will allow the two objects to move along their respective long axes. But that will only, uh, that piston joint, as you see here, is exactly what we did. So inside the robot's body, we start by putting the two legs, and we connect the two legs to the body with two piston joints, and those piston joints push the objects out of the sides of uh, the rectangular body segment. But what allows them to be, uh, what allows them to become increasingly vertical? Any ideas? Remember that the legs are not just getting longer, but they are also rotating. Uh, did you just move the cylinder out of the box to which it is attached? Uh, that's right, so that's that's the piston joint. So the piston joint is pushing us, the two cylinders, which, which are initially inside the box, pushing each of them out their respective side of the box. But how do the legs become increasingly vertical? That's it. So Caruso says a function neuron with a linearly increasing function. So I'm going to just do this with one leg. And uh, let's see, I need a, here we go. Okay, if we have the body of the robot and we have the leg inside the body. We are not simply connecting the leg by a piston joint to the body. We are connecting the leg to a small cylinder and uh, a small sphere and the cylinder is connected to the sphere with a one degree of freedom hinge joint. We attach a function neuron, as Caruso mentioned, and that function neuron sends out a constantly changing value. 
which is sent to the motor neuron, causing the desired angle of that hinge joint to become increasingly negative. And the ball that connect, that's connected to the cylinder, that ball is connected to uh, the body segment with a rotation, uh, with a uh, with a piston, so that it is gradually pushed out of the body and makes the leg increasingly vertical. Okay, some of you could probably replicate that pretty easily uh, in PyroSim. And by manipulating those six piston joints and those six uh, hinge joints, we can alter how quickly or how slowly that process happens. And in the fourth and final stage, we throw away the piston uh, and uh, hinge joint altogether and simply attach uh, the leg to the body in a vertical, in a vertical orientation. There we go. So here we, here we are throwing away uh, the scaffold. So in this experiment, so in this experiment, there are a total of six piston joints, six hinge joints, which are, and those 12 joints together are being used to control, <coughs> are being used to uh, control ontogenetic change. But there are an additional one, two, three, four joints that connect neighboring body segments together, which answers um, Daniel's question about how a legless robot can, can move. There are motor neurons that are controlling the spine of the robot and allowing the trunk of the robot to, to rotate as well. So we've got one, two, three, four hinge joints in the body itself. And then we have an additional six motors, which are controlling additional hinge joints, which allow the leg to rotate relative to the trunk. So we have, let me, so for one leg, we have a total of three joints, one piston, one hinge joint, which allow, which we control as the investigators, which allow a vertical displacement. And then finally, a second hinge joint, which allows rotation forward and back. If the leg is vertical or it allows, uh, uh, sorry, it allows forward and back regardless of the horizontal or vertical orientation of the leg. Yeah. Okay, so we have six hinge joints that evolution is going to control that allow the movement of the leg itself, plus the four neuron, motor neurons in the spine. So there are a total of 10 motor neurons at the output layer of the neural network controller. So evolution can play with uh, moving those 10 joints the additional 12 joints, the additional six, the, the six, uh, sorry, the addition, yeah, the additional 12, the six slider joints and the six hinge joints, evolution cannot control those. We are controlling those, which allows us to add uh, different kinds of scaffolding. Uh, Daniel says, uh, so the piston joint evolves into a shoulder joint as time goes on. It doesn't actually evolve, it just eventually just goes away. We don't need it anymore. So in Q you can see that in uh, the fourth and the fifth experiment, um, uh, sorry, we actually, we only need the piston joint in the fifth experiment. We only need it to extrude the leg. It's never being controlled by evolution. And in the uh, phase four of the fifth experiment and panel Q here, we throw away the hinge joint altogether. We don't need it anymore. But throughout this evolutionary process, there are always 10 motor neurons, four controlling the spine and six controlling the rotation of the leg. There may be additional joints that we are using to affect ontogenetic change, but evolution does not have any access to those. Okay, that's a lot of information. So um, that concludes the methods or the description of how this experiment works. I'm gonna switch now and talk about the results. Which of these five uh, experiments did better, than, uh, did better than the others? But I'll just pause for a moment in case anyone has any other uh, questions. Okay, sounds like we're okay. So um, we're gonna look at a lot of results, but like before, we're gonna do this gradually. 
So as I mentioned, we did 500, uh, we did 500 runs of 100 each of five different experiments. In each simulation, in all 500 evolutionary algorithms, we always place the light source directly in front of the robot. Let's look at the first of the five evolutionary algorithms, the easiest one. No ontogenetic change, no phylogenetic change. The robot starts and ends in the upright uh, legged configuration. That corresponds to the light gray bar you see here. And it took us a little over 5,000 simulations. So uh, I don't remember how many, what, what the population size was or the number of generations, but basically we kept we kept doing more and more generations of the evolutionary algorithm until we got a successful controller for this robot and stopped the evolutionary algorithm at that time and then looked at how many evaluations we did or how many simulations we ran and across the 100 evolutionary algorithms we ran on this robot on average it took us 5,000 simulations or it took evolution 500 simulations to find one, uh, one controller that got the robot to the light source. Okay, when we introduced phylogenetic change, the second experiment here, where the robot changes over evolutionary time, but there is no change to the body over ontogenetic time, it took it made things slightly harder on evolution on the evolutionary algorithm. It took us a, it took it a little bit more than five thousand robot evaluations to get to the light source. And when we added in ontogenetic change as well, things got even harder on the evolutionary algorithm. So this was a little bit worrying to us when we did this experiment because it seems that when we added scaffolding, the dark gray and the black bars, the scaffolding actually made things harder on evolution rather than easier. And in retrospect, um, if you thought at all about um, scaffolding, that can sometimes be a danger. So, for example, if we have a young child that's trying to learn to ride a bicycle and we add training wheels to the bicycle, she may actually exploit some feature of the training wheels and learn not to ride a bicycle, but learn how to ride a bicycle with training wheels. Her strategy for riding that machine may be so reliant on the training wheels that when we remove the training wheels, she falls over and she basically has to start learning to ride a bicycle all over again without training wheels. So if we ask how long does it take for that particular young person to learn to ride a bike, it's the time it took her to learn how to ride a bike with training wheels plus the time it took her to ride a bike without training wheels. And that might, in some cases, be longer than simply learning how to ride a bicycle with no training wheels. So this is always the, the danger of scaffolding, that is that the learner, as they learn, as they begin learning, are going to become overly uh, reliant on the scaffolding. And that seems to be what happened here. So we continued on nonetheless, and we did a bunch of additional experiments. So I'm only showing you the first three of the five experiments for now. 100 runs of this, 100 runs of this, and 100 runs of this. We felt that maybe the task was too simple. We placed the light source directly in front of the robot. So we did another experiment where we now place the light source pi over 16 radians um, front and just to the left of the robot and redid another 300 evolutionary runs and asked again, is scaffolding useful? When the light source is front left, you can see actually that the scaffolding still hurts. So the dark gray bar and the black bar are higher than the light gray bar. Remember, light gray bar is no scaffolding. Um, so that seemed promising, so we continued on. We now did another 300 evolutionary runs where we placed the light source uh, 2 pi over 16 or pi over 8 radians to the robot's left, so a little bit more to the robot's left. Did 700, 800, 900 uh, evolutionary runs, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900. Now the middle scaffolding isn't hurting, but the 
full scaffolding with phylogenetic and ontogenetic change is still hurting. We continued on to 3 pi over 16, and then finally, when we did 100 runs of, uh, we, when we did 300 evolutionary runs where now the light source is pi over 4, or 45 degrees to the robot's left, now the two forms of scaffolding are helping. If for some reason, when we take the quadruped and we place the light source front left, it helps evolution if it starts evolving controllers for the flat robot, and then gradually that flat robot becomes increasingly vertical over its lifetime. So in this final set of experiments, it took evolution on average about 10,000 simulations to eventually find a controller that succeeds on the upright legged robot. If, there's, if we only work with the upright-legged robot, it takes more. It takes almost uh, 15,000 evaluations to, get, uh, to find a successful controller that gets the robot to the light source. Um, you'll notice that in this figure here, there are these uh, connecting arches between these bars here. These connecting arches are, uh, indicate a test about whether these, the heights of the connected bars are actually different from one another. Uh, at the moment, although it looks like the light gray bar, bar is higher than the other two, this, the, lo um, the lower position of these two bars is not significant. So we're going to do a statistical test. Uh, we did a statistical test, and although it looks like they're lower, they're not lower by enough to count as a, as a valid difference or a, a, enough of a difference. But it definitely does look promising. It looks like there is some improvement or there is some use to adding in this morphological scaffolding. Remember, at this point, we're only looking at parametric change, the parameter that describes the angle of the legs relative to the body. We are not looking at experiment. We have not looked at experiment four and five yet, which is topological change the legs growing out of the body. But already with these first three experiments, we're seeing the beginnings of use for morphological scaffolding. I have a question for you. Why do you think the scaffolding starts to help when the, odd, when the light source is placed front left of the robot, but it wasn't helpful when the object was directly in front of the robot? If you have an idea, think on that. If you have an idea, uh, please go ahead and write it into chat. Uh, Mark Kirby says, did you run for over 5,000 generations? Not 5,000 generations, 5,000 evaluations. Remember, during any one generation, we, if we have a population size of 100, we need to do 100 simulations, right, or 100 evaluations. So if, uh, if, we, did, uh, if we have a population size of 100 and we run, uh, and we run 50 generations, 50 times 100 would be 5,000 robot evaluations. I don't remember in this experiment what our population size was, but it was somewhere around 100. Hopefully that answers your question, Mark. Okay, so um, no takers on my question about why scaffolding is helpful for when the light source is front left. Remember, uh, uh, even in an ideal walk, the robot would have to change its heading during the simulation, so the need to explore morphologies within a single simulation increases. So the need to... Okay, I think uh, EBC 2020 Sense is, is on to the, the answer here, which is, of course, as the robot is turning its, its heading, um, it's helpful to explore different morphologies, um, because the environment is different, but the, the real reason here is that um, if, imagine the upright robot, or the upright robot eventually has to get to the light source on its front left, and while the upright legged robot is walking, there is an increased likelihood that it will fall over if it's walking and turning. 
than there is if it's walking straight forward. Remember when we started talking about this experiment, the idea would be that morphological scaffold, scaffolding helps evolution by breaking, so uh, allowing evolution not to have to solve two problems simultaneously. It can solve the displacement problem, then the stability problem. So the stability problem is actually more difficult when the light source is front left because the robot has to turn. So by breaking apart these two, an easy and a hard problem in the case of front left light source, clearly that it's uh, the scaffolding is helpful to break apart the easy and hard problem than it was when the light source was front center, in which case scaffolding breaks apart two easy problems. So maybe evolution, or it seems that in this case, evolution can solve the two easy problems, which is displacement and maintaining a bit of stability. Just all you need to do is walk forward. That's possible, but it wasn't possible for evolution to solve the easy and the more difficult stability problem when the light source is placed front left. Okay, let's move on to topological change now and see whether that scaffolding helped in these five different conditions. Okay, let's let's walk our way through this experiment. Again, we're going to start by uh, evolving robots where the light source is uh, directly in front of the robot, slightly to the robot's left, and so on until over here the light source is 45 degrees to the robot's front left. The light gray bars here are exact copies of the light gray bars over here. And the light gray bars, remember, connote no, uh, no morphological scaffolding at all. The dark gray bar in this plot corresponds to the fourth experiment, which is topological change at the phylogenetic time scale. Right? No legs short stubby legs, slightly longer, slightly more vertical legs, and then finally full length vertical legs here. In this fourth experiment, even when the light source is front left, this particular form of scaffolding made things much harder on evolution. It took longer to find successful controllers in this evolutionary algorithm than it did in this evolutionary algorithm. The dark gray bar is higher than the light gray bar. But when we put uh, top a lot, when we change the topology of the robot over evolutionary time and ontogenetic time in the fifth experiment, that gives us the black bar over here, that form of scaffolding significantly helps. The, the height of this bar is statistically significantly lower than the height of this bar. The two asterisks right here on the connecting bridge tell us visually that this bar, we can trust the fact that this bar truly is lower than this bar. Why did, uh, why did this form of scaffolding hurt evolution, but this form of scaffolding helped evolution? Can anybody see why that might be the case? What is it about this, about this particular phylogenetic change, these four bodies, that make it harder for evolution to continually evolve successful controllers across these four bodies? If the scaffold hurt, that meant that somehow evolution was overly relying on something. And when that was taken away or changed, those previously fit controllers dropped uh, a long distance in terms of fitness. So this is like the young girl who becomes overly reliant on training wheels. And when they're removed, she has to start learning from scratch all over again. Why does that occur here? but not here. This is a little, is a little more difficult to see the reason. 
uh, stability became more difficult uh, for each for each phase. That's right. So stability doesn't matter at all here. Here stability matters a little bit, but not too much. Here stability becomes more of an issue, and here stability becomes more of an issue again. But that's also true in the fifth experiment. Here stability uh, doesn't matter too much at the beginning. It becomes a little bit more important at the end. But stability matters more here. The robot has to maintain its upright posture for longer. Stability becomes more of an issue here, and again, more of an issue here. So the challenge of stability is gradually going up over both experiments. But why is that particular form of scaffolding harmful here and helpful here? Because the one above uh, does not have legs to start, but the one below does. Exactly. So Mark's got the right idea. So in J here, when this evolutionary algorithm starts, it's only controlling the four joints in the spine. That's the only way that evolution can get this robot to move. Right? So it can only control the legs in the spine, or it can only control the hinge joints in the spine. And then suddenly, once a controller evolves to get basically this snake robot to the light source, those controllers are suddenly re-ran, but they're now run in a robot that has six small additional legs. Remember I said that all of these controllers have ten motor neurons four controlling the spine and six controlling the legs. In J, four, six of those ten motor neurons doesn't matter what the values they, they send out, nothing happens. They're sending signals to legs that simply aren't there. In K, suddenly there are. Suddenly the robot, the controller, has to control these new things that it's never controlled before. Um, so this is like the girl who's suddenly experiencing a bicycle without training wheels, but has become very reliant on the training wheels, right? So evolution basically has to start again when it experiences this body plan, but it also in, in some way has to start all over again when it reaches L because it's never experienced uh, legs that are this long before. And then evolution has to start again here because the controllers have not experienced legs that are this long. In the fifth experiment, um, controllers evolve to get the legless robot to move during the first few time steps of an individual simulation. But that same controller has to also keep moving the robot as its legs become longer. So things are kind of both challenging and easy for this kind of controller. Easy in the sense that it doesn't take much to get a legless robot to start moving because you don't have to deal with stability but difficult in the sense that this controller is, is in a sense, operating different body plans. Yeah? So this controller has some experience with lots of different bodies, and when it reaches G, that controller is experiencing the same uh, set of body plans from legless to legged. Oh, sorry, there we go. In this case, controllers from this from N, when they reach phase O here, they're experiencing the same range of body plans. It's just that those body plans are changing from one to the next faster. Yeah? So presumably from the point of view of the controllers, O is a little bit more familiar than N compared to K compared to J. Hopefully everyone can, can see that. Yeah? Okay, so uh, we have a total of 100, 200, 300, 600, 900, 1200, 1500, plus uh, we redid the non-scaffolding here, so 1500 runs here, we redid everything here, so it gives a total of 3000 evolutionary runs here. This was a very computationally expensive uh, experiment. We did all of this run on the Vermont Advanced Computing Core, or the VAC. This is UVM's uh, supercomputer. Um, if we had done all of this work on a single PC, it would have taken 50 years. Uh, it took us about two months on uh, the VAC to do all this. 
We ran all this on the quadruped, but as you saw in the video, we also tested this on the hexapod. So we did exactly the same experiment um, with different, with and without different kinds of scaffolding, but on the six-legged robot. And you'll notice that in this case here, with the first, second, and third experiments run on the hexapod, scaffolding was more helpful here. And we can tell it's more helpful because we see a lot more asterisks. And remember that the asterisks tell us that each pairwise comparison here, the asterisks associated with each bridge, tells us that those two uh, bars are significantly different in height from uh, each other. For, so for some reason, for the hexapod, the scaffolding was um, uh, very useful. And again, in the fourth and fifth experiment, let me just back up so you can see the fourth and fifth experiment again. Remember, this is phylogenetic topological change. The middle gray bar made things harder on evolution. The fifth and final experiment made things easier on evolution. That's also true in the hexapod. So topological, ch just topological change, sorry, just phylogenetic topological change made things harder on evolution in the hexapod as well. But when we added in ontogenetic topological change as well, so, par so phylogenetic and ontogenetic uh, topological change, uh, we really helped evolution to find successful phototacting controllers for the quadrupedal robot. Okay. So, um, let's just pause here for a moment. I'll, are there any questions? We have uh, four minutes uh, left. Any other question? Any other questions? Okay, uh, I'm gonna show you one last set of results in the four minutes that we have left. Um, and what I'm going to show you is I'm going to try and alternate between these two slides. Let's talk about the vertical axis in this new slide. In the original slide, the vertical axis was how many simulations evolution had to, had to run in order to find successful phototacting controllers. The vertical axis in this plot is showing for those, those final successful controllers, that worked in the upright-legged robot, how robust are those controllers? So how do we measure robustness? Well, I took, for example, if we go to this experiment here, remember there are 100 evolutionary algorithms here. Each of those 100 evolutionary algorithms produced one champion, the controller that gets the upright-legged robot to the light source. I took those 100 controllers and I replayed them on the upright-legged robot, but when I replayed those 100 controllers, I introduced wind. So I added some external uh, random perturbations to the robot, which it, it never experienced during evolution. And I measured um, how far the robot moved without wind, which is what it experienced during evolution, compared to how far it moves with the wind, and I measured the percent drop in displacement. How, how, um, how less a distance does the perturbed uh, controller travel compared to the unperturbed uh, controller? So if a robot travels half as far, then the drop in performance, the drop in performance when perturbed is 50%, which is off the top of this, this chart here. So if we look at just this bar here, we'll see that the non-scaffolded controllers dropped in by about 25%, a little less than 25% their distance. So they're traveling three quarters as far as they did when they were perturbed compared to when they were unperturbed. And that's more or less constant for uh, the second and third evolutionary algorithm as well. It's, the scaffolding is not helping us to produce any more or less uh, robust robots. But if we look at experiment four and five, which is the topological body, body change, going from legless to legged, and we look over here, we'll notice that um, not, notice that um, the controllers produced by the topological scaffold 
experience less of a drop in performance compared to the non-scaffolded controllers, the light gray bar compared to the black bar. Remember that this fourth experiment actually made things harder on evolution. So I want you to focus just on this bar and this bar. So the, the lower black bar here means these controllers are more robust than these controllers. And it took us less time in evolutionary time or number of simulations to find it. So that's a pretty surprising result. I'll just go back and forth. So we found controllers faster in the black bar or the topological scaffolding uh, than in the light gray bar where there's no scaffolding. It took us less time to find successful controllers and they were more robust. Usually it's the other way around. If we want a control, a controller that's robust, meaning it allows the robot to do what it's supposed to do in lots of different conditions, we need to do more evolution or more simulations. If you remember back to assignment 10, for every controller you had to run four simulations for just one controller to measure its robustness to position of the, the light source. With enough evolutionary effort, you can make it happen, but usually if we, want more, if we want more robustness, we need more computation. The scaffolding has suggested that we can break this, uh, we can break this synergy. So now we can produce more robust controllers with even less uh, evolution. So this answers the question of why evolve morphology. One of the answers to why evolving morphology is because morphology can provide a scaffold. I'm going to leave you with a question. Why do, why do, why do these controllers um, produced by this particular form of scaffold, why are they more robust? They've never experienced wind before. Why do they do a better job of dealing with wind than the non-scaffolded robots? I'll leave that as a question. We'll come back to that question uh, Thursday morning. For the UVM students, you have a quiz due uh, tonight. And otherwise, I hope to see you back here on the stream on Thursday morning. Have a good uh, rest of your day.